It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Welcome to the After Show on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and we are broadcasting live and waiting to hear from you at the end of day two of the Telecom TV Summit on Cloud Native Telco. Now, we held another two roundtable discussions today, one on best practices for creating telco DevOps teams and the other on how telcos are using Kubernetes as an edge platform. And we are joined on this live Q&A program by several of our panelists. In fact, it's standing room only today. So now is the time to submit your questions on these topics if you haven't already done so. And we will look to answer as many as we can. Just use the online form right here on the website. As usual, co-hosting the after show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Now, Ray, earlier today, you interviewed Francesca Cerevalli from Colt Technology Services. Are you getting the sense that telcos are now fully committed to cloud native? Yes, Guy. Uh, I spoke with uh, Francesca earlier today. It was interesting to note she signed off with a plea for developers to focus on pure ground up cloud native function development. Uh, and not the shortcuts that uh, that she's been seeing. And we've been hearing such pleas for a while now. So there's a, a message for the vendor community there. Uh, and I think we're seeing ever more evidence that CICD is becoming part of the day-to-day -day operational processes within network operators. But it's also very clear that this is a gradual development, not a big bang. And that is going to be a mix of legacy technology and processes alongside cloud-oriented deployments and processes for years to come. And of course, a mix of private and public cloud platform use, which should make for some interesting analysis when it comes to OPEX efficiencies, I think. Yeah, well, we do need to give the finance teams something to do. But yes, hugely positive progress we're hearing here. Uh, OK, let's find out who's joining us live on our supersized show today. Heather Kirksey, VP Ecosystem and Community at LF Networking. Neil McRae, Managing Director, Architecture and Technology Strategy and Chief Architect for BT. Danielle Royston, CEO and Founder of Telco DR. Rajesh Garia, who is VP and CTO Network Platforms Group at Intel. Susan James, Senior Director, Telecommunications Strategy at Red Hat. Ahmed Zaidi, who is Telco Cloud NFE 5G Core Architect for Orange. And Beth Cohen, SDN Product Strategies with Verizon. Hello, everyone. Very good to see you all again. Uh, now, if you thought we had a lot of audience questions yesterday, well, we have even more today. So, Ray, let's spin up the first question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Guy. Uh, so, Heather, we're going to come to you first with this one. And it's a question that looks like it's the result of our Kubernetes panel. And the question is, uh, the telco user group in CNCF is doing exactly as Neil requests about trying to shape Kubernetes for telco workloads. What are the major challenges in shaping Kubernetes for telecom operators? Um, yeah, so for me, the major challenge um, is not necessarily the core of Kubernetes itself. It's that ecosystem of the network stack around Kubernetes. So to me, it is the network plugins. It is figuring out um, uh, security, and it is also around um, data plane and acceleration technologies that you choose to build the network with. Um, in addition to Telcom User Group in CNCF, uh, these are a lot of the challenges that we're focused on in the Anikit project within LF Networking um, as well, both on sort of specking out requirements and test cases and in then building reference implementations and test suites. OK, so plenty of work going on there. Susan will come to you next and then Rajesh. So, Susan. OK, I, I, to hear this point, you know, it, it's not just about Kubernetes. It's actually how you actually pull together all of the other projects that you need to be uh, working on and actually doing the lifecycle management of all of these things together. So 
there are certainly a lot of things that need to be done there and not just from a, a day one perspective because getting the applications to run is one thing you know doing the automation and the day two operations becomes really important i think that harks back to some of the the um lessons we've learned over the years in that you know getting the, the initial workload up and running is is certainly challenging but being able to do that at scale on day two three 365 is really key in, in these things being adopted and, and actually being successful. Okay, thank you, Susan. And uh, Rajesh, let's come to you. I mean, what are the major challenges in shaping Kubernetes for telcos? Yeah, you know, uh, first of all, it is great to see Kubernetes being adopted and deployed in telco and edge deployments. Now, instead of reinventing the wheel, we should really build on the success of Kubernetes. Now, I, I think the main challenges are in the areas of supporting heterogeneous infrastructure with uh, accelerators, GPUs, smart mix, um, and the disaggregation and composability of an end-to-end -end service while meeting the telco KPIs is another key challenge at the moment. And there are other problems to be solved with respect to quality of service, latency, and deploying microservices across multiple edge and cloud clusters. But these are all solvable problems in my mind. Now at Intel, we realize that Kubernetes can be extended to support telco workloads. Um, and as part of that, we've led many Kubernetes extensions needed for telco, um, such as Multus, I think comes to mind, uh, to broker multiple CNIs, um, the SRIOV CNI to allow container network functions to access networks directly uh, by passing the Linux kernel, um, by passing the Linux kernel and the need for packet processing CNF, such as uh, the RAN, DU, CUUP and UPF. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think there are challenges, but it's good to see that these are all actually soluble uh, problems and um, it's good to see the collaboration um, that's happening. Um, uh, so I'm actually bullish on Kubernetes as um, we are already seeing good adoption and we're also seeing a lot of interest in the community to address the challenges that um, uh, I think Heather, Susan and I talked about. Okay, excellent. Thanks Rajesh. And uh, Neil, let's come to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo um, what the what the previous speakers have said. I think that the other thing we need to be cautious about is complexity. Um, you know, just just building up the solution and and all the different infrastructure parts and and ensuring that it all runs um, as effectively as we want it to and that it's manageable is is probably the actually the hard part of of running Kubernetes. Um, you know, what's your toolkit? How are you running those tools? Um, what's your sentry points? How, how are you getting telemetry from it? Um, and again, all of these things are, are kind of discussions that are happening in, in, in quite a few forums right now. But that those, those part, parts tend to be the harder part. And then, you know, how do we design for, in Telco, how do we design for Kubernetes? And then how do we run for Kubernetes? Because you know, we're also starting to look at server serverless um, microservices where we actually don't reserve any hardware. We just we just have an app that, that on demand um, takes hold of what it needs, does what it needs, and then disappears. So um, it's a you know it's a continual evolution of uh, capability that allows us to be as efficient as we can be. But let's keep it simple, or as or only as as complex as it needs to be, because I think. Um, you know, in, in building a, a cloud native five G core network, there's a lot. We find a lot of complexity there that just doesn't add any value, frankly. So, you know, let's let's keep it simple too. Okay, yeah, uh, and I I think we've we've heard that quite a lot in, in the past year. There's a lot of a lot of willing uh, to go down this route. Uh, but also still an awful lot to learn. Like you say, complexity, you don't want to be bringing that into the network at all. Um, okay, uh, Guy, I think uh, time to move on to, to our next audience question. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And this next question, Neil, I'm going to put this one to you. It's, it's rather specific and you were on the DevOps panel earlier today. So um, I'd like to put this one to you first, if I may. The question is, uh, why do you, the panel that is, why do you tie together DevOps and hyperscaler cloud? Surely DevOps principles and foundations are valid for any other context supporting services and applications. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think um, 
I just think it's a bit easier to. I think when you use a, a kind of DevOps approach, it's easier to get stuff out of the public cloud. That's that's my own personal experience. And, and as I mentioned, then we run our entire TV platform in the cloud and, and have done since since it went live almost four or five years ago. So um, I, I think you know there's 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 more to it than just DevOps. Though there's you know what framework. How you how you working with the different parts of your business to make sure you've got the right outcomes? Are you adopting an agile um, approach, or or even in DevOps, are you are you, are you approaching an SRE uh, model? Because in some applications and some use cases, we think that might be better. Um, not it's not a fight. It's just one one way works better for some use cases. Another way works better for other use cases. But I couldn't agree more. I, I think you know the more that we the more that we can do incrementally as telcos, the more that we can get feature functionality and monetization of the network out there quicker. Um, then I don't, frankly, I don't care what we use as long as we're able to get stuff out there and into our customers' hands and the value of it uh, into our customers' hands, so that they, you know, we can generate a return on all the network investment that we're making. As long as it delivers results and value. Thank you, Neil and and Beth. You'd like to comment on the DevOps question? Yes, I would. Uh, so one of the things that I think the hyperscalers really bring to the table is that they have a lot of experience with development and they have a lot of development tools uh, that the telcos, you know, traditionally are not particularly developers. I mean, we rely on our partners uh, for many of our development projects. Um, so I think it's a very fruitful business relationship. And, uh, you know, we're creating that ecosystem to really allow us to create some really new and interesting applications um, and uh, you know particularly around edge uh, where you know the telco brings the strength of our networks of course and the and the hyperscalers are bringing the strength of their of their development tools so I see that as a very fruitful um, and ongoing partnership going forward Great, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, and uh, some of, of our viewers may have noticed that we have temporarily, at least, lost Ahmed to the depths of the internet. Uh, have no fear because we are doing our utmost best to retrieve him and bring him back to the after show. Uh, so we'll, we'll hope for some progress as the show goes on. But in the meantime, Ray, I'm gonna come across to you for our next question. Okay, uh, thanks, Guy. Uh, so our next viewer question, uh, we're going to put this to you first, Danielle. Uh, and the question is, will telcos have to adopt a full cloud native approach if they decide to leverage public cloud for their 5G service delivery? Uh, this is a very topical question, of course, with the uh, imminent launch of, uh, uh, of services from DISH. Yeah, so this is live TV, you can tell. I have window washers that are <laughs> entering my view. So sorry about that. Uh, we'll just keep, go I'll just keep going. Um, yeah, but thanks, Ray, for the question. And I'll go ahead and try to answer it very briefly and, and get off the camera so it's not too loud. Um, you know, I love, I mean, as the public cloud evangelist in telco, I love all the conversation that we're having. I mean, it used to be hardly any, and now it's, I mean, almost every day I wake up to new articles about this. And I think one thing is, is that people have sort of equated uh, cloud native with using Kubernetes. And I think it's much more than that. I think if you're going to get the benefits out of using the public cloud with a 5G core, you actually need to be, and I'm going to introduce a new a new term to our lexicon here, public cloud native, right? Which is really starting to use very deeply the services of the public cloud. And so, yeah, I, I think you need to go more than just being cloud native and using Kubernetes. You need to do things like what Neil's talking about, which is adopting serverless, really understanding the services that are available there at the public cloud, whichever hyperscaler you pick, and using those, um, those services very deeply. I think that starts to introduce all the the scary thoughts around vendor lock-in and, you know, am I putting too many eggs in one basket with one hyperscaler and people tend to start to want to say, Hey, I want to, I want to abstract that and keep it, keep an arm's length so I can, I can take my 5G core network and run at any point. And I'm like, you're not going to do that. You wouldn't do that today. 
So go ahead and give in to the hyperscalers, use their tools very deeply, and that's how you're gonna get the full benefits of the public cloud, which are all the things you love, which is lower cost, you know, elasticity, scalability, reliability. That's why you're there, use them. And so that's what I think. Okay, great, thanks, Danielle. Um, does anybody want to come in and comment on the, the use of, okay, yeah, all right, we'll come to Susan first and then over to Neil. Okay. I think there was a couple of good points that Danielle made in one of the other panels as well in that there is still some journey for the public clouds to go as well in terms of having you know ubiquitous services. So when you're deploying your, your 5G uh, network, you, you're going to need to have um, those deployments across a, a diverse geographical area. And today, you know, you don't have that uh, homogenous cloud. We like to think that it's homogenous, but in reality, you know, regions can often have quite different services. So, you know, there, it's going to take a while for the applications to get there to be, as Danielle put it, you know, public cloud native. But I think there's also more work to be done on the public clouds as well to be able to do that. But certainly that's the direction that things are going. Okay, yeah, excellent point, Susan. And Neil, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to put more in a public cloud, but it's so expensive. I mean, you know, we in Telco, you know, we, we're we trying to make a, a return so we can build RAN and FTTP and pe keep people connected. And then we have these public cloud guys that, you know, literally charge me by the minute um, for for usage, for bandwidth transfer, which is our core job. My job in, in Telco is to make bandwidth move, make traffic move. And, and they charge me for it, which is not a model that's compatible with Telco because we're in we're in an unlimited model. So, you know, look, I put you know, we have our TV platform in, in public cloud, and and, it, and and actually one of our debates is should we move it to our network cloud? Which actually we could do. We press a button and literally move it because we've built orchestration to allow us to do that. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the the public cloud is where a lot of my customers are, not all of them. So we'll always be there. Um, but but I, I have to think, you know, when, when I hear it's not expensive, I'm like, crikey, we're either doing something wildly wrong um, or, I've, or I've missed a discount code somewhere on, on Microsoft.com. So, you know, I, I really, really um, would like to hear more about how it's going to save me money because right now it definitely doesn't. Okay, uh, we'll we'll come to Beth next, and then we'll go back to uh, to Danielle, who I think might have that code, but we'll see. So we'll come to Beth first. So I, I'm echoing what Neil said. So you know, uh, we've dabbled in public cloud. We've moved some stuff to public cloud where it made sense. Uh, we also have moved stuff out of public cloud. It is not cheaper. Uh, you know, we can build things at scale, um, just like the public cloud can. Uh, and um, we're also finding many of our customers are multi-cloud, uh, multi-hyperscaler. So that that's the trend. Uh, you know, nobody's putting all their uh, eggs in in one hyperscaler anymore. They're all they're all setting it up so they can all orchestrate back and forth between all the public clouds. And uh, you know, I think what we've found is, yeah, there are some things that that fit in the public cloud, particularly you know, some of the front end services, uh, but the core network services, uh, we've pulled back and primarily run them in our own clouds as well. Okay, great, thanks Beth. And uh, so Danielle, uh, back over to you. Yeah, you know, I love Twitter. I'm on Twitter in a big way, at least I'm trying to be, and there's a lot of discussion about this topic. There was a, uh, an article written by Andreessen Horowitz, um, a blog on uh, repatriation and building workloads for repatriation and how the public cloud isn't cheaper, especially when you start to scale and all that stuff. And there was a, a really, really healthy deb debate. And if this is something that you're interested in, you should go check out. I mean, it was it went on for a few days. But I think when you build for repatriation, you're giving up some of those big benefits that do get you the lower cost. You should see lower costs in the public cloud. And when you build your workloads in a way, when you can understand those economics and adopt new services as they become available, you will be able to continue to drive lower and lower costs. So I'll give you an example with chipsets, right? With AWS, they've built their own custom chips. 
Graviton 2 ARM chips. Um, the minute they introduced them, it was a 40% price improvement. So if you were able to move your workloads from the Intel uh, machines at AWS to Graviton 2, and it takes a little bit of work, but not a ton. I mean, we're talking weeks maybe. To move your workloads over, you automatically can shrink the amount of commute, compute you're using, the number of machines you're using, and save money instantly. And they're constantly, you know, they're coming out with their new chips that they're introducing. And, and so you have to build your organization and your workloads in a way that you can adopt uh, the new economics as they change. And it's very dynamic. And most uh, organizations don't have this capability. They sort of think like, we pick a technology, we do all this analysis, we're going to stay on that technology for years. And I think with public cloud now, as they introduce new services and new chips and new offerings, you have to be very, very nimble and be able to do the technology and economic trade-offs. And if you're able to do that, you will be able to continuously drive your costs down. And so um, I don't think you should be thinking about repatriation. I think you should be able, you should be using the public cloud and understanding those economics. And it should be cheaper. And if it's not cheaper, give me a call. That's what I do. Um, I look for ways and I usually can find 50% savings on anyone's public cloud usage. Five, zero. Call me, Neil. If you're struggling with this, I can help you. Five, zero. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, we've been running AMD and, and other processors for years to save money. I can move any workload to anywhere and it's not about repatriation, it's about where the customer is. Um, you know, so we have customers one day they're in Microsoft, the next day they say, hey, we want to move to AWS, or they say, hey, we want to move to Google. And, and we have to be able to move workloads. It's just, you know, that's, that's being in the game. Um, but it's, it, you know, price is one thing, economic model is an entirely different thing. And the public cloud doesn't have an economic model that aligns with telco. And my challenge to them is, you want to put more of our stuff onto public cloud? Just check, you know, look at your model. Because it doesn't matter how cheap you make it. Um, unless you get to that unlimited space, it's not going. It's never going to be cheap enough. So, you know, Daniel, let's have a chat about it. Because, you know, I've got a couple of guys in, in um, my team from, from Oxford who are uh, maths experts and economics experts, and, and they struggle to see it. And... and it's not that we we actually don't care. No one's going to differentiate on public cloud or private cloud in the telco space these days. So we don't really care. We just want what's good for our customers, what makes it more affordable. And personally, from my own point of view, my mission is to get people connected. If we can take cost out and get more people connected, if I can spend more money building fiber all over the UK, hell yes, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sign up tomorrow. But right now, their model doesn't compute with how telcos actually work and play and serve customers. Yeah, I would love to help you and yeah, let's do it. This, this is what these live debates are all about. We're advancing the conversation here and I'm sure there's other operators that would like to, to, to find out if there's the, the potential for a specific uh, public cloud model for the telco industry going forward. So um, you know, watch this space. Uh, okay, Guy. I think uh, you know as we're as time is heading on, we need to move on to the next question. Indeed, we do want to get as many of our viewers' questions in as we possibly can, and uh, we do welcome back Ahmeda. Uh, uh, for now, it looks like we've rescued him from the internet, which is great. So hopefully, we'll be coming to Ahmed very, very soon. Um, and please keep the questions coming in. Uh, there's still a little bit of time for us to answer more of your questions. Rajesh, I'm going to come to you for our, our next question, uh, which is from an audience member. And the question is, will a cloud native designed and deployed 5G network really save network capex and opex? And if so, in, in which areas are these savings to be made? So I, I definitely think that a cloud native 5G network will save both network capex and opex. Um, network virtualization with NFV has already delivered um, significant CapEx benefits. But I believe actually cloud deployments not only bring more efficiency and CapEx benefit, but because of massive automation that is afforded, we will begin to see significant OPEX benefits as well. So um, to give you an example, a key partner of Intel, Rakuten Mobile, 
their chief technology officer puts his total network savings at 40% of CapEx and 30% on OpEx. And this is just the beginning of the cloud data transformation. And there is so much more work to do and benefits to be had. And, and to me, actually, it's not just about CapEx and OpEx alone. Uh, it's really about making the infrastructure programmable and scalable. As we know, we are in the era of distributed computing. We are seeing a lot of computing at the edge. Um, industrial IoT, enterprises deploying SASE as example, dynamic CDN, smart cities, uh, among others. And this trend requires the flexibility for distributed computing across multiple edge and clouds. So it's not about uh, private network cloud or public cloud alone. It's the level of flexibility, composability of applications with microservices, placement of workloads where you can get the best performance, performance per watt and performance per dollar, and the massive at scale automation that can only be delivered with a cloud native approach. So yes, in my mind, um, CapEx and OpEx are definitely a part of it. And while there are some doubters, I do think we will see definite benefits, but it's uh, really the larger implication towards delivering edge services. Uh, that's where the telco should really focus on. Um, and then I actually also wanted to quickly respond to what Daniel was talking about in terms of uh, the benefits she's seeing in public cloud deployments. I think she mentioned Graviton. Um, I do think that one of the problems that we have is really um, how we efficiently enable the heterogeneous compute. I think there are, you know, as you sort of like begin to deploy telco workloads and adopt more cloud native practices, it's really about um, efficiently using uh, all the accelerations, for example, for VRAN baseband acceleration. And today, um, some of the, uh, the Intel instances in public cloud uh, don't allow you to do that. And that's one of the things that we as a community should focus on. How do we actually make sure that heterogeneous compute, accelerators, GPUs are truly enabled in the cloud native Kubernetes uh, based infrastructure? And that's something that uh, Intel's actually working hard, working with the community. And, and as I actually mentioned earlier, I think when things are enabled right, um, you will see a pretty significant benefit. And, and this is actually true for the IA instances, whether they're running in private cloud or public cloud as well. So um, yes, I think, uh, like I said, um, CapEx and OpEx, part of it, but it's really, I think we should think broadly. I think it's really about end-to-end -end services enabled by 5G and uh, distributed computing. Great, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, well, that's a good uh, representative vendor view. Let's get a representative telco view with Beth. Uh, so I, what I'm finding is, uh, you know, there's a number of benefits to 5G um, and uh, particularly in the last mile problem, which is, of course, the most expensive part of any kind of network. Uh, so the fixed wireless um, type model and, um, you know, sort of the revival of the municipal Wi-Fi um, concept using 5G is definitely viable. Um, and another thing which I think 5G is going to save a lot is um, the way the United States is populated. It tends to be densely populated on the East Coast and the West Coast. And then there's the what we call what we refer to as the flyover states in the middle um, and the populations which are quite dispersed um, are quite underserved for broadband at this point. And um, I believe that 5G and um, these and these newer technologies can really address that issue. Um, that you know the infrastructure to support broadband to the rural areas and to lightly populated areas is an acute problem. Um, that I think that you know that's where the the savings in having how we build infrastructure will allow us to deliver those services to these areas uh, where, you know, in the older technology, you know, bringing broadband or, or fiber, um, it's just not cost effective. Thanks, Beth. Well, let's go quickly go over to Neil for a comment as well. Yeah, look, I mean, I think the cloud native part of this um, or the or the adaptability, the, the automation is what we need. So, you know, telco is a is a business on its own, as a connectivity business on its own, is is heading towards utility. Hence, hence my point about the the model for for public cloud. Um, if we want to generate more cash to invest in the build of FTTP six G when it comes along, 
then we need to build more services for customers and more solutions for customers. And having a, 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 a kind of an on-demand platform that we can build those solutions on and deploy them actually even on-prem to, to customer factories, or we have some uh, edge compute in Wembley Stadium, being able to bring our bring applications directly um, close to the to where the customer is super close allows us to to create new services, generate new ideas, and and open up new revenue streams. For me, that's crucially important. If telcos do not open up new revenue streams, then we'll just become like the electricity or the gas company, where you pay, you know, a flat fee a month, and and we make a two or three percent return. That's where we've got to get to. So for me, cloud cloud native allows us to become much more of an application provider, much more of a solution provider. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and, and I think uh, as, as much as I would love to come to Danielle for some uh, ex extra comments here, um, I think whilst we do a little bit of maintenance um, in Austin, Texas, we're going to go over to, to Ray because we've got to get uh, another question in. But we'll come back to Danielle uh, very shortly, I am sure. But Ray, over to you first. OK, thanks, Guy. Uh, so uh, this next audience question, we're going to direct it to, to Susan first. Uh, and the question is, uh, in retrospect, it feels like we've wasted time with NFE uh, rather than move rapidly to cloud native functions. Are we able to quickly pivot to cloud native functions or will NFE be yet one more legacy technology that has to be supported? So I think what they're getting at there is, you know, do we continue to roll out virtualization or do we pivot to, to containerized um, applications? And I think, you know, that's a journey that will be individual for each of the, the service providers. So I guess we'll throw to them a, a, at one point as well. But but certainly from a, a development perspective and, and the bulk of the applications that are being developed now are actually being developed in containers for a containerized network. So I think we will see a pivot go much faster towards, um, you know, Kubernetes-based uh, containerized uh, network functions. And that, that transition will happen much faster. And part of the reason that that will happen much faster is that a lot of the re-architecting was already happening in terms of decoupling the uh, applications from not just the hardware, but they were built on platforms. So the operation and maintenance, uh, you know, the logging, the alarms, all of this stuff was built in a platform and that needs to now be done by the application. So that work has been going on for the last couple of years. And, you know, the way that we're also, uh, we've learned those lessons from, from the virtualization journey so that we talked about before, you know, the Kubernetes networking, the security, you know, the, the you know, uh, integration with Prometheus and all of these other things is happening much, much faster than it did with the, the NFV journey. So, it certainly wasn't wasted. A lot of those learnings we've taken uh, and we've applied already, uh, and that will also transition much more rapidly into the, the RAN deployments going forward. So it's not a wasted journey. In terms of how quickly the service providers pivot from, say, a virtualized infrastructure to a containerized, you also have to take in, into account things like, where is my workforce? Uh, how, you know, au fait are they with, um, uh, Kubernetes and, and containerization workloads because, you know, it's actually incredibly difficult to recruit people that already know this stuff. So it's going to be about taking that whole of your organization on that journey with you. And that won't happen overnight. So, you know, back to the, the traditional statement, you know, what you expect will happen in, in 10 years, you'll underestimate. What you expect in two years, you'll probably overestimate. I still think it will go much faster than it did with anything. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. And Beth, I could see you You wanted to come in on this one as well. Certainly, certainly. Uh, so what I've seen is uh, the shift from, um, from physical um, bare metal to, or the appliance model to, to the NFV model, um, there was a lot of what I call lift and shift, which is they didn't actually re-architect those, those um, applications in those systems as much as they should have um, to take advantage of the virtualization. So, you know, to a certain extent, there was a fair amount of laziness uh, where they just took the application and just dumped it into a VM. So um, I agree with Susan that, that um, it will happen faster, but 
I think a lot of vendors are underestimating the level of effort that it will take to re-architect because at this, you know, you can't just lift it in and drop it into a, a, a container. You do in fact have to rethink how that application is served, how that application is cut up, um, serverless, uh, making decisions around serverless and, and, and what parts of the application stay in the container, what parts of the application are, are in the underlying uh, infrastructure of the containers. That's um, particularly around security and, and supporting the security of the applications. That's something that I think that many vendors just have started down that journey. And there aren't any best practices around that yet, uh, particularly in the telco industry. And a lot of the work around containers was greenfield. Um, and, and you know, a lot of these applications are not greenfield applications. So I think there's going to be a lot of struggle over the next two to three years as as that accelerates. Okay, great, thanks. And Rajesh, we'll come to you uh, very briefly, uh, but we we need to uh, to move on very quickly after that. So, Rajesh. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Actually, I, I tend to agree with um, everything that's been said. Right, I think it was uh, really important. Uh, I, I don't think it's a wasted effort at all. Um, I think. What we achieved with NFE was the hardware software disaggregation, which was an important step. Um, I think the uh, if the last decade was about that uh, hardware software disaggregation, I think the next decade is actually going to be about the software disaggregation. And um, I think it's important to remember that a lot of uh, the cloud native technologies have actually matured over the last uh, four or five years. And when we started the NFE journey, um, we were not there with um, you know, some of the cloud native approaches. So I think it's a natural transition. And we have to also remember that a lot of 5G deployments, um, uh, like the early 5G deployments have been with uh, an NFE approach. So I think we are, we are at the right um, time. I think um, uh, it, there's some really good progress towards migrating to cloud native practices. And uh, uh, you, you know, I, I think we are seeing some really good momentum and uh, we're going to actually build from the, the success that we have actually seen with NFP. So I'm actually pretty pleased with where we are and the progress of the Okay, good foundations for, for what's coming next. Okay, great. Guy, uh, back over to you in a fa fast moving show. It is a fast moving show with lots and lots going on. Uh, time to check in on our audience poll for this year's Cloud Native Telco Summit. One question for this week, five multiple choice answers. And the question we are asking is, will all telcos adopt cloud native practices throughout their network and operations teams? I can tell you that we have nearly doubled yesterday's record number of votes. And as you can see from the real time percentages here, there is still an overwhelming belief that telcos will embrace cloud native. In fact, it's even more positive than it was yesterday. So it does appear that the debate is now about to what extent will they embrace cloud native. OK, back to our Q&A and looking at the studio clock there, we're about 40 minutes into the programme. So we still just about have time for a couple more questions. So I will quickly hand back to you, Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. So, uh, Ahmed, a uh, question here for you from our audience. And the question is, is telco cloud really a special use case? Shouldn't telcos just jump on board the Kubernetes ecosystem uh, and, uh, and develop from there? Um, so, is telco such a special use case? Yes, you're right. Uh, Telco uh, are very specific use case, and I think is the most uh, complicated use case also. And uh, the, we are we cannot able to at least to jump uh, Kubernetes on the existing system because as uh, what we are looking for is to to take benefits from all the cloud native and Kubernetes and uh, all things that like CI/CD. So unfortunately, we are, we are not able to 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 jump uh, Kubernetes on the existing system. We need also as operator to to have something new and to benefit from to to take benefit from all cloud native that we can have now. Uh, let's say from at least from the five G five five G in general. Okay, thanks, Ahmed uh, and Susan. Uh, you wanted to come in there on this one as well. 
Yeah, I, I think when you talk about that, it, it's a bit more nuanced than that. You know, if you're talking about in the you know internal IT systems, the OSS, BSS, then of course it's going to go much faster than if you're talking about the network. So, you know, the, it's going to go much more rapidly in terms of cloud native, and you'd of course see many more of those applications already deployed in public cloud. The network workloads are going to take some more time. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, anybody else wanting to uh, come in on this, or if not, we will move. Uh, Neil, but yeah, Neil, and then Daniel. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, I think the, the direction is 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 pretty obvious. Of, as to where we're headed on this. Um, but I think, you know, I, I kind of link this to the previous question. One of the, the challenges with NFV was how complex it was and, and how hard it was. So, you know, I, I think if we still, if, if, if we keep the, the, the mind that in telco, we have a lot of state, you know, we, and we're doing a lot of things to take that state out and manage state in a different way. If we keep doing that, then I think, you know, we can move more towards the sort of model that, that um, other applications run on, in a, you know, microservices on a Kubernetes environment. Um, but you know, we do. There are some very specific um, requirements around legal intercept, around security that does require us to think differently. And and I think if you are a customer of mine, you'd want me to be thinking about those things. And 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 that's what makes some of our our requirements slightly different. Are they different enough that the, the world is going to end from from being able to deploy on Kubernetes? Hell no, um, but but we can't ignore the requirement. That that would be bad and, and likely to to en end up making us think again about what the best solution for us is. Okay, thanks, Neil uh, and Danielle, and then uh, back to Susan quickly, and then we'll move on to to Guy for what will probably be the the, the final question for today. So, Danielle. Yeah, I want to remind everyone why we're doing all this cloud native activity and really why I encourage people to use the public cloud, right? I mean, Neil mentioned it at the beginning of this of this um, episode is that we're trying to create new revenue streams. We're trying to monetize more, grow our ARPU that continues to be siphoned off by the OTT players. And the reason why I encourage people to use the public cloud is that you you get to leverage the best technology that's out there, built by three of the best technologists in the world that are continuing to add to the functionality, put out new services, and you get to go over the top on their investment. And I think by abstracting that out and not managing all of the plumbing that we've done historically, now allows you to spend your organizational energy right your people in your in your company to focus on new ideas to monetize new things which is what why we do all of this in the first place and so i'm going to encourage telcos to continue to stop thinking about why we can't use a public cloud and all the reasons why we're special and different and how it won't work and instead try to figure out how we get through these roadblocks and solve these problems so we can stand on the shoulders of these giants and use it for our benefit and not be relegated to some sort of utility or pipe but instead provide real value to our subscribers. And so I think that's what we need to think about. It's not just about Kubernetes, it's about using the public cloud, right? It's not about building a private cloud in our own environment, right? And still managing all of this complexity um, that's, that's there. It's a, I mean, Neil mentioned it at the beginning and Neil and I could have like a really good discussion over a beer probably, right? But I'm saying move it to the public cloud, leverage, their, solve all your cost issues, solve your legal compliance problems, your regulatory issues, and leverage that as much as you can, maybe not everywhere, but as much as you can, so you can focus your organizational energy on monetizing more and growing your ARPU. That's what you need to do. Okay, remember these questions are coming from the industry here. Um, so, and this is what they're thinking about. So Susan, we'll come to you for the, the final comment on this and, and then back to Guy. Yeah. So I think one of the things that, you know, is really important to, to think about, and Danielle touched on it as well, you know, there is a finite of resources that, that every company has, and can you really afford to be investing those resources in, in doing the life cycle management of the hardware and the underlying infrastructure? So absolutely moving 
you know, those workloads to public cloud where you can then focus your energy on actually doing what you do to make your business run most efficiently and, and you know, most uh, get the most uh, services out the most quickly, I think is absolutely the right thing to do. But I think one of the things that we do miss, and, and Danielle also touched on this, is many of the workloads that, that some of the service providers want to move to the public cloud, they're not able to due to regulatory you know, reasons. So part of navigating that regulatory uh, requirements that they have in each end of those individual companies is certainly a big barrier and probably much larger than, than what a number of us had actually initially anticipated. So I think that is one of those tricky things that every country and every telco is going to have to navigate with their, their individual governments going forward. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Guy, back over to you. And I feel that uh, we are crunching time now. We are crunching time, Ray. Thank you very much. Uh, but we do have an important final question to close with. And Beth, I'm going to uh, direct this one towards you first. And the question is, what are the security risks in cloud native environments? And are there any additional concerns for telcos? Very interesting question. And, and of course, uh, Susan touched on at least part of the question and the part of the uh, the challenge, which is that, you know, as a telco, we are under regulatory um, uh, purview, and there are things that we have to do that the um, hyperscalers and the public cloud just have been struggling with. I will use as an example, um, in the United States, we have something called CALEA, uh, which is, uh, is a requirement that law enforcement um, have access to certain types of um, uh, data, you know, based on court orders and subpoenas. And um, we, we have been running into issues that um, we cannot offer um, appropriate CALEA guidelines within the hyperscalers. And that has actually caused us to not be able to offer some services that we would like to, that our customers want, um, because of those legal barriers. Um, and so, you know, legal and regulatory barriers tie in with security, of course, and security, of course, has become, you know, much, um, you know, much in the forefront uh, in the headlines recently. Um, it's been there for all along, but it's become even more uh, sensitive as people are more aware of it. And, uh, you know, the fundamental, uh, I have always found that when new technology comes along um, and, and cloud native, one can argue is, is new technology. Yeah, it's been around for five or six years at this point, but, you know, it usually takes about 20, 25 years for technology to really become embedded. Um, and typically when new technology comes along, security is put on a back burner. It's not built in from day one. And that was true of the container um, containers because containers were originally built for, you know, single entities. So, you know, they didn't have to worry about the security of the underlying shared hyper, you know, the shared infrastructure. Um, and, you know, of course, that's not true in the telco world. And uh, we do have to separate those, those um, applications in, in, a, in a way that the containers need to be re-architected to support. Uh, so I see that there, there will be a shift. Um, you know, I, I, we will, it's a technical problem, we will solve it, uh, but it, security is definitely a, a major forefront issue for any telco. And, uh, you know, we cannot um, deliver services without a lot of security um, to support our you know, need to protect our customers' data and protect ourselves and, and meet our regulatory requirements. Absolutely. Good point, Beth. Uh, thank you for that. And I think that was a, a very good point to end our discussion on because our time really is up. It is the end of our after show for today. So thank you all so much for joining us on this live program and to our audience for sending in their questions. We did try and get through as many of them as we possibly 
could. And that brings this year's Cloud Native Telco Summit to a close. After three years of these summits, Ray, it's becoming really apparent that telcos now accept Cloud Native. It's no longer a question of if, but how. Uh, absolutely. And I think the big remaining question is when, as in when will cloud native dominate telco operations? Well, meanwhile, we'll do our best to help frame the discussions to address those big questions. It's the end of our cloud native telco summit, but we do have more to come. Absolutely. And we've got some absolute bangers coming down the telecom TV pipeline. We've got a 6G research and innovation summit on the 6th and 7th of October. I cannot wait to see what the industry has to share on that topic right now. And then, of course, the Open RAN summit on the 26th to the 28th of October. And that, I can tell you, is already a full house and spilling out into the marquee in the garden. <laughs> I do love a garden party, Ray. Uh, really looking forward to both of those. Watch out for news and updates on Telecom TV, and we will see you next month. Goodbye for now. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience.